outline for tonight. We're starting a new, um, not a, it's a new section of the same topic that we've been talking about, and that is God's sovereignty and our, our trusting in Him. Really, that's the theme of it, is trusting God and trusting His sovereignty. Um, that's what this first section has been all about. This next section is a very important part of the whole because we'll be exploring what our responsibility is when we choose to believe in God's sovereignty. And we're going to be looking at this uh, particular branch of that topic, and that is, does God's sovereignty negate any responsibility of ours to live responsible and prudent lives? And there's an old story about a man who carried the doctrine of God's sovereignty to such an extreme that he drifted into sort of a divine fatalism and one day walking down a flight of stairs, he carelessly stumbled and fell headlong to the bottom of the staircase and picking himself up and kind of examining himself to be sure he wasn't too bruised, he said, well, I'm sure glad that one's over. And Sometimes people can get into a feeling of fatalism. I think of uh, the matter of extreme Calvinism where a person says, well, whoever's going to come to God is going to come to God. They don't need me to do it. And that's really de denying the very command that God gave each one of his, his believers, and that was to go into all the world and give people the gospel. How shall they hear? And we can get into that kind of a, a thinking if we're not careful. A student who fails an important exam tries to excuse himself by saying, well, God is sovereign and he determined that I should fail that exam. Or a driver can cause an auto accident and in his own mind evade carelessness by attributing the accident to God's sovereignty. And obviously both attitudes are unbiblical and foolish, yet we, we can get into those things sometimes. I have known of people personally that have really struggled with the sovereignty of God because they feel like, uh, why, why even plan your life? And again, because it's God's going to do it the way he's going to do it. And that's a wrong way of looking at it. And it's not a biblical way of looking at it. So we're going to look at this first section, Roman numeral 1. And this is sovereignty and prayer. Sovereignty and prayer. Last time we talked about God's sovereignty over the weather and we've had several times where our services have been canceled because of the weather and it seems like last time, last winter that happened quite a few times, more than I've ever been used to. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana and in Indiana it's not it's not a, uh, an unusual thing to have two to three feet of snow. And we, we were right there close to the Lake Michigan and there's the lake effect. And I, I just remember so many winters of heavy snow. And, but rarely were our church services canceled. And but that was another day, and I understand that. We canceled some services because of COVID-19. In fact, one of our speakers that was scheduled to come that spring 
called and canceled because they didn't want to be exposed. And um, we did schedule them a couple of years later, and that was the Matskos that were here. George Matsko was here. Um, I remember one time we had a couples retreat, and at the last minute, and I mean the last minute, the speaker canceled because his wife was in a severe car accident and he needed to be there for her. But he found another pastor in the area that was able to come in his place and we had a wonderful couples retreat. But we have those things happen. I remember another time when we had a man coming to give a science, kind of a science. He was gonna only be here for a service because he was here for some other things in the city and, and uh, the person who was hosting him asked if we would like him to come and I said sure. And he was scheduled to be here on a Sunday evening and a little earlier that day, I think it was in the afternoon that I was called and they said that uh, they were not able, he wasn't answering his phone in his motel and so eventually they um, got the police and they went and unlocked the door and he was dead. He had uh, collapsed, I believe, from a heart attack. He was an older man, um, but a very faithful man of God that has been in the ministry for, for many years. And, but he, he was with the Lord and therefore I had to preach that night. <laughs> How many of you have had a flight canceled before for weather? Okay, quite a few of you. And maybe you were suffering from some anxiety as far as, you know, what am I going to do? They're waiting for me on the other end. And some people do have that anxiety. And the Lord says, be anxious for nothing, right? But... What? Yeah. Okay, good. So it's be anxious and pray. And I want to I want us to look at this a little bit tonight. Um, that God's so part of our responsibility is not only not to be anxious, but it is to pray. And We don't just say, well, what will be, will be. We pray and, and it says, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Maybe it was because, maybe your flight was canceled because of um, ice on the, on the plane or because there was some kind of a mechanical problem and you might be praying, Lord, pr you're not anxious, but you're saying, Lord, I have this meeting scheduled and um, my request would be that you would allow this to be solved that I could still go. But Lord, your will be done. So God's sovereignty doesn't exclude prayer requests. And we are called to make those requests known to God. But oftentimes we find ourselves in situations outside of our control. And when that is the case, do we, do we pray? Do we simply submit to God's sovereignty without anything else? And, and we can submit to God's sovereignty. But I'm just saying, do we, we say, well, it's God's sovereign will and I won't tell the Lord anything or walk, talk to him about anything? But that's, that's not what the scriptures describe our Christian life as. It's not as what will be, will be. So it's not enough to not be anxious, but we are to make our request known to God. And then the knowledge of his sovereignty is meant to be an encouragement to pray. I don't think we think of it in that way. 
The knowledge of his sovereignty is meant to be an encouragement to pray, not an excuse to lapse into a sort of pious fatalism. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. In verse, starting in verse 24, and this is when Peter and John came back from being um, in jail for witnessing. And it says they came back and they met with the church, the people. And so when they heard that, it says they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So he's acknowledging all through this, the sovereignty of God, right? Sovereignty of God and allowing this to happen to to, um, Peter and John and then the sovereignty of God and allowing Jesus Christ to be crucified. But then notice in verse 29, that's not the end of it. They say, now, Lord, look on their threats And grant to your servants with all boldness that we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That's a request. And they were asking God to do something powerful. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Oftentimes things that are outside of our control are actually an opportunity For God to be glorified. And that's a time where we we can make our request known and wanting God's will to be done. So they believed because God was sovereign. They believed because they knew they had a sovereign God who was powerful and That's why they brought this request to the Lord. All they knew really is that they were to, God, Christ had commanded them to be witnesses. And so they were, they wanted to obey that command. And they said, okay, there's resistance here from the authorities. Lord, give us boldness to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the other in, utter ends of the world. So they prayed, and you sense in this prayer a confidence because that was a prayer request that they knew would be in the will of God. Prayer assumes the sovereignty of God. Prayer assumes the sovereignty of God. If God isn't sovereign, we have no assurance that he is even able to answer our prayers. But the fact that he is sovereign means that he has the power to answer. But while God's sovereignty along with his wisdom and love is the foundation of our trust in him, prayer is the expression of the trust. One of the Puritans His name is Thomas Lye in a sermon entitled, How Are We to Live by Faith on Divine Providence? And he said, As prayer without faith is but a beating of the air, so trust without prayer is but a presumptuous bravado. He that promises to give and bids us trust his promises commands us to pray and expect obedience to his commands. He will give but not without asking. See, God God wants us to ask. God likes to be asked. 
And when we ask in his will, then it will glorify God. Turn to the big book of Philemon. Right before the book of Hebrews. And we have just a a brief verse. Paul, while imprisoned in Rome, wrote to his friend Philemon, and he said this, But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Through your prayers... I will be restored to you. And you notice he he wasn't saying I, he said I trust that I will be. So he's leaving that door open that maybe this isn't God's will, but he's saying "I, I trust that through your prayers I shall be restored to you, shall be granted to you. And he asked Philemon to pray. That's, that's huge. Prayer was the expression of his confidence in the sovereignty of God and that he might answer that prayer. And then turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. John Flavel was another Puritan preacher, and he was a prolific writer. I have several books by him in my office. He wrote a classic treatise entitled The Mystery of Providence. It was first published in 1678. I have a copy of that. Um, And it's instructive to notice that Flavel begins this treatise on the sovereign providence of God with a discourse on Psalm 57.2. Look at what it says. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. It's another way of saying it. In other words, Flavel says to us, because God is sovereign, we should pray. God's sovereignty does not negate our responsibility to pray, but rather makes it possible to pray with confidence. That should be an encouragement to us. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. It's encouraging to go, when you're reading through the Bible some year just to put a little P beside those verses that are promises and then go back to them. This next section is God's sovereignty and prudence. God's sovereignty and prudence. First one is prayer, the second one is prudence. When we think of prudence, we think of what? What would be some synonyms for the word prudence? Okay, wisdom. Anything else? That's good. Caution. Maybe planning. Planning ahead. There's prudence and Proverbs talks about that. Just as God's sovereignty does not set aside our responsibility to pray, it also does not negate our responsible, I'm sorry, responsibility to act prudently. And in this context, act, act, act prudently means to use all legitimate biblical means at our disposal to avoid harm to ourselves or others and to bring about what we believe to be a right, the right course of events. 
One of the illustrations of that, biblical illustrations of that, would be David as he was running from Saul who was trying to kill him and he evaded him and David was already anointed king by Samuel and he knew that that was the case and God, so that was God's will for him to be king. But that didn't mean that he didn't wisely avoid Saul. David had already been anointed. David was confident that God will fulfill his purpose for him. Yet David took all the precautions he could to avoid being killed by Saul. He didn't presume on the sovereignty of God but rather acted prudently in dependence on God. He prayed for God's protection. And we have many psalms that are the evidence of that and to bless his efforts. We have Paul in Acts 27 where he has the story involves Paul's trip to Rome and the shipwreck that took place on the island of Malta and after being battered at sea for many days by a storm, and when everybody had given up all hope of being saved, Paul stood before them and said, don't be afraid, God's appeared, God's told me that everybody will be saved. And Paul not only trusted in the sovereignty of God, he had an express revelation from heaven that no life would be lost in the shipwreck. Yet a little bit later, when he saw the sailors trying to escape from the ship with the lifeboat, he said to the Roman centurion, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So he, he realized that the presence of the skilled sailors was necessary for the safety of the passengers even at that point. And he took prudent action, he, he voiced his concern, and as a result of that, all the, everyone was stayed, and God's purpose was accomplished. So God, uh, Paul did not consider God's sovereign person a purpose, a reason to neglect his duty, even though in that instance, God's purpose had been revealed to him by an angel from heaven. Now, we today don't usually have those kind of experiences. And we don't always know God's sovereign purpose in a specific situation. But we have biblical principles. And we should be even more aware not to use God's sovereignty as an excuse to shirk the duties that he has commanded in the scriptures. God usually works through means and he intends that we use the means he has placed at our disposal. We have a situation like that in Nehemiah where Nehemiah was there to build the walls of Jerusalem and he and his people faced a threat of attack from the, those who were living in the area that didn't want them there and he did, they didn't want them building Jerusalem. And here's what it says. In fact, turn to Nehemiah 4, right before Psalms, right before Job. Nehemiah 4, chapter 4, and look at verses 7 through 9. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and uh, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard the, that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, notice that, that was first, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. So 
the prayer to God did not exclude taking responsible action for safety. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, he goes on, look at verse 13. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, every one to his work. But notice what it says. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So there was responsibility, even though there was also a dependence on the sovereignty of God. There was human responsibility that didn't negate the sovereignty of God. It was actually dependence on God's sovereignty, that he was powerful. And he, he even said this, he said, our God will fight for us. He believed in the sovereignty of God. And then one of the most basic means of prudence that God has given to us is prayer. We must not only pray for his overruling providence in our lives as David did, but we must also pray for wisdom to rightly understand our circumstances and use the means he has given us. We're to, we're to filter all of our circumstances through the truth of God's word. And we're to be asking ourselves, Lord, what do you want to teach us through this? What should I be praying for at this time? When the Gibeonites, do you remember the Gibeonites in the Old Testament? The Gibeonites were a, a nation that actually lived very close to the Israelites, but they deceived the Israelites because they, they were afraid of the Israelites because of all the stories that they heard of them coming out of Egypt and God's supernatural provision for them and how they had just conquered before entering the, the promised land. They had just conquered two kings. And so they were afraid. And so they put on old clothes that had holes in them that looked like they were worn and they were, they'd been traveling for a long time. They put old bread that was stale and stiff in their knapsacks. And they came and they liked, tried to look as haggard as they could and they wanted to make a covenant with them. And the Bible says, what was, what was Joshua's mistake? Right, he, he didn't seek the Lord. He didn't ask the Lord's counsel. So as a result, they were deceived by the Gibeonites and made a treaty with them when they should have destroyed them. So they didn't do what they should have done, and that was pray before they acted upon what their responsibility might be. They weren't prudent. Have you ever been in that position? <laughs> Where we, you didn't pray? Another means of prudence God has given us is the opportunity to seek wise and godly counsel. Proverbs 15, 22 says, without counsel, Plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. 
And then the, you have the other side of it that says in Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So what should you do before you go to your counselors? <laughs> yeah, you need to pray. Pray that you would choose the right counsel and the right counselors and then pray that the Lord would lead through that. So the whole time you're depending on the Lord and it's God's words, word that said without counsel plans go awry but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So a person's plans only succeed with God's counsel, with the sovereign, believing in the sovereignty of God. Do you remember what happened to King Asa? King Asa had conquered the Ethiopians who numbered him two to one, and he won that battle. But then 15 or 20 years later, he was facing Basha, the king of Israel. And you don't sense that he was following the Lord. It was a time of affluence. It was a time where they had had peace for many years. And when that, when King Basha came up against him. What did he do? He didn't, there's no record that he prayed. It says that he, he sent a messenger to the Syrian king asking him to come and support them. And it worked. When that Syrian king came, then Basha left. But it worked humanly speaking. And God said, if you, he said, my will was that you would destroy the Syrians, but now you're going to have to deal with them for many years. They'll be your thorn in your side. So again, King Asa might have said, look, it was successful. Well, not in God's eyes, it wasn't. And it showed that he wasn't really relying on God. He was depending on his own conniving, doing it his way instead of doing it God's way. So when I say a person's plan succeed only with the sovereign will of God, we've got to be looking at it from God's standpoint. If you're looking at it on a temporary basis, you might see some success, humanly speaking, but it's not going to be the success that God wants. And remember that all the wise counsel in the world cannot enable our plans to succeed contrary to the sovereign will of God. God uses the wise counsel of others to bring our plans into line with his sovereign will. And then the, the next section is prayer and prudence. I just mentioned Nehemiah's situation where he used prayer. He went to the Lord in prayer, plus he used prudence in being responsible and with their safety. Prayer is the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and of our dependence on him to act on our behalf. Prudence is the acknowledgement of our responsibility to use all legitimate means. And that word legitimate obviously is a very strategic word. And we, we must never separate those two. Don't separate them from one another. They, they work together. God's sovereignty and our responsibility throughout life. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles. Chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 18 
through 20, it says the sons of Reuben, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had 44,760 valiant men, men able to bear shield and sword, to shoot with the bow, and skillful in war who went to war. They made war with the Hagrites, Jatur, Naphish, and Nodab, and they were helped against them. And the Hagrites were delivered into their hand and all who were with them, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer because they put their trust in him. Again, we see this wedding of prayer, dependence on God, dependence on the sovereignty of God, and then also the responsibility that they went out believing that God was with them and they, they had prayed before they ever went out. And God sovereignly intervened. He handed all their enemies over to them because they prayed. They were prudent. They had taken precautions to be able to fight when they needed to. But they also were trusting in God. That was their primary, their primary concern was, Lord, be with us. And we need to realize, all of us, we can e so easily forget that all of our plans, all of our efforts, all of our prudence is to no avail unless God prospers those means. This is a common verse that we've all heard, Psalm 127.1. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In that passage, there's this, the concept of both offensive and defensive efforts, of both building for progress and watching against destruction. And in a sense, the verse sums up all of our responsibilities in life, whether it be in the physical, the mental, or the spiritual we should always be building and watching. So Psalm 127 says, none of those efforts will prosper unless God intervenes, intervenes in them. And note how strongly the psalmist describes the necessity of God's intervention in our efforts. He doesn't say unless God blesses or helps the builders and the watchmen, their efforts are in vain. Rather, he speaks in terms of God himself building the house and watching over the city. Let's find out what it is. What is it? Oh, okay. Okay. So it's really important that we see that, that it's, it's, it's stating that unless the Lord builds the house, and it's almost like the Lord is doing it. And that's the way we have to think of it, unless the Lord is doing it because we have depended on him, we've prayerfully sought him, and we're saying, Lord, we can't do this without you, then it will fail. But at the same time, there's no suggestion in the text that God replaces the builders and the watchmen. They're, they're, they're there. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to build it. So the builders are there. They're doing their part. They're, they're being responsible. They're prudent. So the obvious meaning is that in every respect, we are dependent on God to enable us and prosper our efforts. I think that's a good way to start the day. I've been trying to do this as much as possible. First thing in the morning is just yielding myself to God, saying, Lord, you guide me today. I'm your servant and Help me in all that I do. I want to be right in the middle of your will. And I yield myself to you.
We must to the same degree depend on him to enable us to do what must what we must do for ourselves. I think a farmer is a is a good illustration of that. A farmer must use all of his skills and his experience and his resources to produce a harvest and yet the harvest is God's. He's the one that controls the weather. He's the one that controls the water spigot. And he could wipe out the harvest if he wants. The farmer's utterly dependent upon God to control nature so that his crop will grow. You know, we can, we've planted seed before and put it out there hoping that it would rain and it, and this summer was a particularly dry summer. And that those seeds did not sprout until we started watering them. And but it's a whole lot easier when God does it. <laughs> and from where does the farmer get his skills, his ability to learn from his experience, the financial resources? to buy the equipment and fertilizer he uses? Where does, where does even his physical strength to do his tasks come from? They're all from God. Gives all men life and breath and everything else, according to Acts 17, 25. So in every respect, we're utterly dependent on God. We're, we're dependent on God for our next heartbeat. We're dependent on God for our body to function in such a way that it... it um, our white blood cells run to the problem. It's amazing. Our bodies rebuild themselves. And our bodies are made with those, those protections to guard us from disease. And yes, we understand that through aging that eventually breaks down. But it's God who protects us. It's God who protects us on the highway. There are times when we can do nothing. And there are times when we must work. There were times where, you remember the Lord said to Israel, this isn't your battle, this is mine. You're not going to fight. <laughs> and he just took them up to the edge of the mountain or the, to the cliff where they looked over the valley and they saw 185,000 soldiers dead. This is my battle. He's a great warrior. <laughs> and he's called a warrior in scripture. But in both instances, whether we have responsibility or whether, or whether it's completely up to God in that particular instance, we don't do anything. In both instances, we are dependent on God. Moses said to the children of Israel when they were in the desert and they were occasionally just totally dependent on God for, for food and water. And Moses said to Israel, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna that he might make you know that, the, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now we as human beings, we try to do everything we can to be self-sufficient, don't we? And there are, there are commands in Scripture that we're supposed to lay aside. Um, and yet the Lord also says that we're to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. And there are, we forget as Americans that there are some people in the world that are living day to day. They don't have a freezer. They don't have a refrigerator. And they're just living on what they can find for, for food that day for their family. And the Israelites had to learn that they could not simply dig into their food supplies to eat whenever they desired. God reduced them to a conscious dependence upon his daily provision. And... <clears throat> 
Many of us have tried to lay it up in store because of things that are going on today. But ultimately, and, and I, I, I think that's wise, but ultimately we have to depend on God. And you remember the Lord said there's going to be a time where you're going to be in the land and you're going to be living off the farms that other have planted. And he said this, he said, make sure you don't forget out of your prosperity, don't forget God. Be careful that you don't say this, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Rather, he warned them to remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. Sometimes God reduces us to a conscious, utter dependence upon him. It might be on a hospital bed. There's nothing we can do. And maybe it's a time where even the doctors have said, we're doing all we can do, but it's out of our hands. Some here in this room have been in that situation. Unemployment has persisted to the point that the cupboard is bare and no job prospects are in sight. And that at times like that, we realize how dependent we are on God. And let me just say, that's not a bad place to be sometimes. In fact, I would say it's not a bad place to be all the time in terms of dependent on God. Because it's at that time that we learn some of the most important principles in our lives. And we learn more about God and his faithfulness. But we are just as dependent in actuality, when the paycheck comes regularly and all of our material needs are met and we have plenty in the, <laughs> in the freezer and in the refrigerator and plenty in the bank, but we're still dependent on God. At the same time, we are responsible. The Bible never allows us to use our other dependence on God as an excuse for indolence. Ecclesiastes 10.18 says, Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Proverbs 24 says, 20 verse 4 says, The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. We are absolutely dependent on God. But at the same time, we are responsible to diligently use whatever means are appropriate for the occasion. So the student who fails her exam and the worker who loses his job for lack of diligence and the person who becomes ill because of poor health habits cannot blame a divine fatalism. They have to take responsibility for themselves for their own wrong in doing that. And God normally works through ordinary circumstances. God normally works by, if we have a particular need in our lives, oftentimes he'll use somebody else to meet that need. He'll prompt them. That's, that's still God's sovereignty and his, his provision, but it's using ordinary means in many, most of the time. I'm going to save the rest for next time. It's a small amount, and we'll also continue in another section.